Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Bible Ponder for this week. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 14, and there's um, a bit of a theme that emerges um, throughout this chapter that um, will become apparent as we look through all um, through through the sections of the chapter. There's also a lot that um, I think has also been um, given to us before by Luke in terms of some of the themes that he has brought out. So already we've seen um, Jesus and the Pharisees have confrontations over the Sabbath day and what's lawful to do on the Sabbath and this idea that um, adhering so strictly to um, specific laws over and above the intent of the law or the heart of the law um, kind of nullifies the whole thing. So it doesn't matter if you follow the rule, if by following the rule you end up neglecting to do good or, or cause harm by doing the rule. And so it's often about healings that he has um, these debates. And this happens here in the very beginning of chapter 14. Um, the, Jesus is at a banquet, which is sort of the setting for this whole chapter. And there's um, someone at the banquet with dropsy or edema, so a, a swelling of either the hands or the legs, most likely. And um, because they are there at the banquet, not somewhere kind of in the back where people of lower social order would have been kind of watching in these sort of open houses, if they're there kind of at the table, it could have been someone um, just of the same status as the Pharisees and one of the Pharisees who's there. And Jesus uses it to say, um, is it lawful to, to heal, to cure people on the Sabbath or not, he says. And again, this is something, a conversation he's had before. And this time they're silent. So before he heals and then they cry out and they're, they're angry, this time he puts it straight to them at a dinner with them, which is not just a dinner, it's a Sabbath dinner. It's quite an intimate and a special meal. And so to, um, it, it's meant to be quite a, a lovely occasion and, and for this kind of thing to happen. It is a bit uncouth, both for the Pharisees and for Jesus, if they're doing it to trap him. And if he's doing this um, to call them out, it creates a lot of tension. Um, but he heals the man with, with the edema and um, they are silent, kind of, which kind of shows that either they're um, in ancient sort of styles of debate, their silence would either be taken as them knowing they're wrong or they know that they're ignorant of the right answer. And so he sort of wins that battle of wits. And he also there at the dinner, he says, um, verse seven, when he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. So he begins to, to tell a parable about people choosing um, the, the best places when they're invited and then Jesus says instead you should pick the lowest place and then the person will come up and actually bring you um, to to the top and this is maybe a bit of a social game and you can imagine the kind of horror of someone who's seating everyone and you know how even in our day and age we still value a bit of a seating chart and, and anyone who has ever planned a wedding knows how planning a seating chart there is certain protocol and certain um, ways in which you um, place people at certain tables and certain tables that are closer to the top table and certain tables that are further away and the kind of pitfalls and who's going to sit where and whose mother-in-law is sitting where and all of that and whose friends are at what table. Um, and, and it was the same back then. And you can imagine a bit of a um, the spectacle would have been you have the setup and, and you have kind of the assumed seating chart of who's sitting where and someone of high social standing is sitting at, at the end of the table or even further out of, of the room in, a, in the place where someone of lower social standing would sit and then the, the host has to come back. No, 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 you're sitting in the wrong place. Let me come and exalt you. Um, and so Jesus says to humble yourself and it's almost kind of this this game that you're playing, but also this idea that don't sit somewhere higher because often if you take a higher position, then you have to be sat um, lower somewhere else. And this is all a bit of a parallel. I don't think Jesus is necessarily advocating for um, the hard and fast rules of social seating charts. Um, but then he also goes on to say, um, when you invite people over, don't invite someone who's going to necessarily reciprocate just because then um, you're only ever getting like for like, but actually invite someone who can't reciprocate because then you're actually doing good. And that's something that the Old Testament advocated as well. 
Then he tells a parable of um, a dinner party, and the great banquet was a metaphor for um, the kingdom of God, even in the Old Testament. So there's this banquet that um, this owner of a piece of land is going to, uh, or, or the the host of the dinner, sorry, is going to to invite all of these people, and one by one, the people can't come. There's the person who's just bought a piece of land, and they have to go and, and see it, which isn't really a good excuse. And there's all these different excuses of why these people can't come. All in all, it gets down to the end where the, the host of the banquet sends out his slave to say, just bring everyone, bring the lowest of the low, compel them, go into the roads and lanes, compel people to come so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. And this, along with the next sort of bit, is it's a lot of um, Jesus kind of getting at this idea that God was there, the kingdom was there for for people, but they have not taken it up. And so now it's being kind of expanded out in a way, or, or at least those who are taking up the position again, not humbling themselves, but actually exalting themselves or are being um, taken away. And remember the setting for this. He's at a Sabbath dinner with Pharisees and, and other people. And um, he's telling stories about um, humility and telling stories about the banquet in which people who were invited didn't take up the invitation. And so he, the slave is out in the streets just gathering anyone, clean or unclean, to come. And then he talks about how difficult it actually is to um, take up this cause and, and follow him. And that it isn't just something you add in or, or something you, you're a part of. He says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father or mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. And so that word hate there, um, obviously you can get the sense, even in our language, it, it probably doesn't mean actively hate, but more in a sense of like spurning. Because remember, family relationships aren't just about love as a sort of feeling in your heart. But family relationships come with obligations, especially in the ancient world, especially, especially, especially in the ancient world, in which family relationships carried really um, quite quite strict and, and rigid social expectations of how you treated your father, how you treated your mother, what your responsibilities were as a son or a daughter, what your responsibilities were as a husband or a wife, what your responsibilities were um, as, as a father, as a mother. Um, and so for him to say, you, you, you have to spurn those obligations in favor of following me is quite a big claim because those things were so important in the ancient world because that's how society worked and especially coming out of, of, you know, quite agrarian society, a, a rustic society in which those are really, really important. There aren't um, government programs. There aren't other social structures for people to support themselves. Family is, is so is everything that you had. And to value um, following Jesus, um, to, to carry the cross and follow Jesus and be his disciple, requires spurning a lot of that is really asking a lot of people it's not saying oh yeah just add this into your life come and be part of this but really to give up everything but he also cautions people to consider this cost he says for which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it otherwise when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish all who see it will begin to ridicule him and so he says don't just like, think you're going to follow me if you can't do it. It says, therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not, do not give up all of your possessions. Not very ambiguous there from Jesus. And then he goes on, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? Um, it is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. They throw it away. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. It's quite a lot of harsh words from Jesus, a lot of really um, unambiguous ways of, of speaking about how difficult it is to, to follow him, to be his disciple, to be part of the kingdom, things about humility and about leaving behind the kind of rules of the past. Um, and as we're moving closer and closer to Jerusalem and to his own death, he is re-emphasizing how what he's doing is new. He's opening 
this kingdom of God up to not just the elite or the religious teachers, but to, um, you know, sending the slave, that image of sending the slave out into the alleys and the streets and just gathering everyone up. And this, these things would have been so offensive to people and um, revolutionary. And he's really not pulling any punches with how difficult it's going to be to be part of it. It's not something easy that he's doing. And I think <clears throat> one of the things to remember with this idea that the gospel is open, the gospel is welcoming, and that we are reaching out to the marginalized, the poor, the oppressed, and all of these um, groups of people in our society who are the most harmed by the sh power structures, by things like white supremacy or by heteronormativity and all of these things, is um, sometimes that's painted as an easy option, as an easy way out, that that's just um, not being intellectually or morally rigorous and it's just sort of going, ah, yeah, whatever, just let it all through. And, and that's even where... Um, that term liberal kind of comes in a, in a pejorative way that it's just, ah, whatever, it doesn't matter, rules be damned, we're just kind of, ah, la, 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 just doing whatever we want. And that is actually the opposite of the case. And I think that's one of the takeaways from this chapter is while Jesus is opening up this idea of the kingdom of God, not being for the elite, not being for the powerful, but being for um, the waifs and strays, as it were, that that is not some easy option that that's really hard. And actually the cost of discipleship, the cost of this following Jesus that actually does open up the gospel to everyone is actually a really, really difficult thing to do. It's difficult to navigate. It's difficult to figure out how we're going to do it. It's difficult to um, manage as it's happening. There's lots of, of tricky situations to manage as we do this. And so I would, would point to this chapter as a way to push back against this idea that being open, being welcoming, and actually being more um, broad in how we spread the gospel is not some easy way out that just the modern world, oh, we're just letting go of um, the morals of the past because it's easy. I think far from it, I think that's actually a much harder position to take than to draw up boundaries, to keep people out and to say, um, no, 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 I get to decide, to decide who's in it, who's out. I think actually that's the easy option. I think that's the less rigorous option. And the one that kind of takes the easy way out is to kind of say, um, no, 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 um, you're, you're in, you're out. Um, I like you, you're in. I don't like you, you're out. I think that's, I think that's the easy way out. Um, so that's what I would um, bring to bear for us from this chapter. Um, so thanks for joining us uh, this week for um, the Bible Ponder, and thank you for, for joining us, um, whether you're watching or listening online. Um, thanks for, for that, and we'll see you next week for chapter 15. Bye-bye.